Hey guys, Forrest here with Rocky Mountain School of Photography and today I have a super exciting review for you guys. Uh, let me grab it right here. It is the Canon EOS RA. So this is Canon's EOS R that's specifically made for astrophotography. Now, I wanna quickly say, we've already done a review on the EOS R on this channel. So if you guys are interested in that, definitely check it out. I'll put it down in the description as well as put a card up there in the corner. This is specifically for the A model. Now, you guys probably know already that I love astrophotography. It's one of my favorite things to do. It's one of my, probably my biggest passion in photography. So the instant that this was announced, I was a huge fan. Um, I actually owned the 60DA, Canon's previous Astro dedicated camera. Um, I never owned the 20DA, but this is actually their third iteration of a dedicated, not dedicated, it can do normal stuff too, but a uh, camera built specifically with Astro photographers in mind. So what I wanna do is break down whether this camera is worth it for you if you are thinking about buying a Canon EOS R, whether it's worth to spring for the A version. Now, the A version has two main differences from from the traditional EOS R. The first is that it's way more sensitive to the hydrogen alpha wavelength, which I think is about 656 nanometers. I know it's about 656 nanometers. And that is that red color that you see in so many nebulae in the sky. It's one of the most common colors when you're shooting big deep sky targets. That red is one of the biggest things you see. And most cameras that are just normal DSLRs or mirrorless cameras are actually built to block a lot of that red color. And the reason being is that it can create some strange things for normal photo targets. Um, but this camera actually allows three times more hydrogen alpha or 656 nanometer light to actually get through and hit the sensor, which means three times more light means if you're shooting a red nebula, you are able to let in three times more light with the same amount of exposure as a traditional camera, which means you can use a way lower ISO or even not need as much of a tracker or as good of a tracker to get the same deep sky signal to noise ratio, which is super awesome. The second change is that it actually has 30X live view. This is something that I'm so happy about and I hope every camera manufacturer eventually puts in their cameras because you guys will know when you're focusing on a little tiny star, the 10X live view that most every camera can produce, it's just not good enough. It's too hard to tell if a tiny star is round or not at only 10X. So this can do 30X and get you way closer in on those stars to check that. So we're gonna be checking both of those out when I do the review. Now, two cons that I wanna name right off the bat with this camera that I noticed right away, having been coming from the Fuji mirrorless world, the first is that this doesn't have a built-in intervalometer, and I really hope Canon puts this in with a future firmware update, because to me, that's a break it thing. Um, I need an intervalometer, I think most photographers need an intervalometer, and having one integrated into the camera is so smart. The camera that I'm shooting this video on is my Fuji X-T30, it's a budget entry-level Fuji camera, and it has a built-in intervalometer. So I have one, like I have one that I can use with this camera, but the fact that you need it is kind of a bummer. The second thing is the shutter speed, the longest shutter speed that this camera can use without going to bulb is 30 seconds. So again, you'll need that external intervalometer to allow you to use a slow shutter speed like 30 seconds or you can use 30 seconds but like one minute two minutes four minutes a lot of other camera manufacturers have built in longer shutter speeds so i'm really hoping that canon can fix those two things via firmware they don't seem like hardware issues to me i think that would make this camera like that much more perfect now, before we get into the actual field test, I want to talk a little bit about my setup for this review. So obviously I'll be using the Canon EOS RA, that's pretty standard. Um, the second thing that I'm going to be attaching it to is the William Optics Space Cat 51. So this is a 51 millimeter front objective. Um, it's got a 250 millimeter focal length and it's just a manual focus telescope from William Optics. So if you guys are interested and you don't own a long lens and you're interested in doing astrophotography, this is actually a super solid option. Getting that 250 millimeter focal length for the $750 that this telescope costs is a really good deal. It's also a quadruplet optical design, which means that it has very little chromatic aberration and it also has a very flat field, which means the edges of the frame should be super sharp. Again, we'll check that out once we do the test shots. Now, a couple quick things. Uh, the Canon mount that the EOS R uses is not that widespread in the astro world. So you actually need a couple of things in order to use the RA 
onto telescope. The first thing that you're gonna need is a T-ring, and this is something that's pretty standard and most astrophotographers know what this is, but a T-ring is an adapter that allows you to attach a bayonet mount camera, like a Canon or a Nikon, to a telescope. And in this case, this telescope uses the 48 millimeter thread. So this is 48 millimeter threading onto a Canon standard EF mount bayonet. Now, problem is the EOS R is an R mount, not EF mount. So we need, or RF mount, excuse me. So we need an EF to RF adapter to allow us to do this. And luckily Canon makes one of these, it's a couple hundred bucks, but you're gonna need something like, that's the Canon Events logo. Again, I'm borrowing this from Canon. Um, but you guys can see this little adapter right here. So what happens is this mount right here mounts to the EOS R A, and then this T ring down here actually attaches to this and this end screws onto the telescope. So essentially we just pancake this or sandwich this between the telescope and the camera and it allows us to connect everything. So you do need a little bit of that. There are dedicated um, T-rings for the new Canon mirrorless cameras, but they're pretty expensive um, and they're not as widespread yet. So that's something that's just gonna come as these Canon mirrorless cameras start to spread throughout more through the astro world. So what I wanna do now is take you guys out in the field. We're gonna set up for a target. Um, I previously have gone into Stellarium and I've built a preset for my camera and mount setup. If you guys are interested in how to do that, I'll leave a link down in the description. Um, I actually have a video on my Fofo Astro YouTube channel that walks through that process, so I'll leave a link down there. But basically what I've done is I've pre-configured this camera and lens combination into Stellarium so I can see the field of view that I'm gonna be working with, and I've found a good set of targets. Where we're gonna be shooting is right around the Rosette Nebula. I think that with the field of view of this telescope, we're gonna be able to actually get three nebulae all in one shot and I think it'll be pretty cool. We're gonna need to get some good integration time on it. It's getting pretty low in the sky. Obviously the days are getting longer every single day, um, good and bad for astrophotography. Um, but I wanna take you guys out in the field. We're gonna set up for this shoot. We're gonna take a look and then we'll look at the results and we'll take a look at what this camera can do. One more thing I forgot to mention with the imaging setup is that I'm actually getting pushed up against an almost full moon when I need to use this camera. I've gotta send it back to Canon first and so my only option is to image it a night like this, which I'm actually glad of because it's gonna make this camera really shine using it in subpar conditions. But in order to deal with all of that moonlight, I'm actually gonna be using a filter to help block that. This is the Optolong, and let me flip it, the LE Enhance two inch filter. And what this is gonna do is this is going to sandwich between the telescope and the camera and block out a lot of that light coming into the sensor. Any of that moonlight's gonna be blocked out and it's only gonna allow through the transmission lines of most nebulae. Now, what's really cool about this filter is if you use a filter like this with an unmodified camera, it blocks out a lot of the light that the sensor can normally see, and the sensor is going to be left not having much light hitting it at all. But because this camera has the hydrogen alpha block removed from it, this filter is actually going to be very well paired with this camera. Now, what's really cool about these, and I don't mean to go into this too long, but I'm kind of excited about it, um, these little LE Enhance filters dual narrowband, they actually look super uh, reflective, like you can see the camera there, but you guys can see a little bit of my face through the filter, right? And I look blue, sorry, I'm looking at the, the screen right now, but I look really blue, and that's because this thing is cutting out almost every uh, wavelength of light except for, like I said, those that the emission nebulae or nebulae in the sky that we're gonna be shooting uh, emit at. So it should work really well. So again, I just wanted to pop in there that this is gonna be on the camera, again, helping us achieve an even better result. All right, you guys, we're out here. Um, it is looking like it's going to be a partly cloudy night, which unfortunately is my kind of least favorite of what we've got. But we're going to get the go ahead and get the cannon up on the uh, tripod here. I'm going to set up the Fornax. Um, I actually have a review on the Fornax that I've done already, so you guys can check that out down in the description. But I'm going to be using the Fornax Light Track 2. We're going to get the whole rig set up. I'm over in the corner of my, my yard that I don't usually use um, simply because I know where my target's going to be and I want to maximize the amount of sky time that I have before it goes. Uh, below the neighbor's house. So we're gonna get everything all set up here and then I'll check back in with you guys. I know I talked about it a little bit in another video, but I've got the Space Cat attached to the William Optics ring here. And then this is a 48 millimeter T mount for Canon EF lenses. And then this is the Canon mount that switches an EF mount to an RF mount for getting that mirrorless mounting system that we can mount the EOS RA to right here. This is the Anchor 26,800 milliamp hour battery pack with power delivery that we're gonna use for supplying power to the mount 
the dew heater, as well as the camera during the night. All right, so at this point, it's just a waiting game. We're gonna wait for it to get dark and then I'll catch up with you guys again when it's time to start imaging and walking through the process. So I just tried the live view zoom, the 30X zoom, and it is insane. So there's a little pocket right now where the moon is out and I was able to get that focus. Unfortunately, the rest of the sky is cloudy right now, but I'm hoping it'll clear up in a minute. But the moon, it's insane. Check this out. <clears throat> so let me get nice and close here. Okay, so let me zoom out. So that right there is the normal view of the moon that this lens is capable of getting, this 250 millimeter lens. And if we just use the 30X optical zoom, you guys can see the amount of detail that we can zoom in on. Now, that's not obviously photo quality. We can't shoot that as a photograph, but to get focus, to be able to see that level of detail, I'm gonna turn the focus ring right now, to be able to see that level of detail is so nice. Those of you who've used Really, let me spin the camera around. Those of you who've used really any astro camera in the past, you'll know how much of a struggle it is to get focus and being able to zoom in that far. Oh, I hope every camera manufacturer does this because that's awesome. All right, you guys, so it's time to go ahead and conclude this review. It ended up being cloudy that night, but in the time that I had the EOS RA, I was able to shoot for five good nights, and each night I was able to get one to two hours of integration time. During that time, I was able to capture two images, one of the cone nebula and one of the heart and soul nebula. Now, I've already talked about how much I loved the 30X live view. I think that's one of the best features and I really hope future cameras get that from other manufacturers as well. I think it's really a hands down, like one of the best features of this camera. It's really easy to focus on nice bright stars, especially if you have a Botanov mask to throw in the front of it to give you those diffraction spikes, it can really make it super simple. Now let me give you a little bit more on the H alpha response and really the low noise aspects of this sensor. So in our previous review, we talked about how much I already liked the EOS R. I think the EOS R was already a great camera. And when you add the H alpha response onto it, it becomes even better. Let me give you an example. The cone nebula shot, which I'll throw up on the screen right now. This is slightly over two hours of integration time using four minute subs. And this was two nights after the full moon, one and two nights after the full moon, which I think is insane. Now, granted, we had a light pollution filter, a very heavy duty dual narrow band light pollution filter, dual band pass. We had a good telescope. We had a good tracker. We had a really good camera. But to do this with only around two hours of integration time absolutely blew my mind. The response of this camera is just beautiful. Then I turned to heart and soul. Heart and soul, this image here, I created with one hour of integration time, exactly one hour. Same filter, same telescope, same setup, but with that little integration time, it just amazed me with the detail that I could pull out of it. Now, I wanna get a little bit into the nitty gritty details of this camera for those of you who know a thing or two about astrophotography. First of all, I wanna talk about the bias and the dark current of this camera. So for one thing, I, I noticed some weird stuff. Um, bias for one, all of the bias values on the sensor were either I think 505 or 506 counts which was very uniform. Uh, literally every single pixel on the sensor in one bias frame was one of those two counts. There were really no outliers, which I had never really seen before having used uh, like an 8300 CCD for a while and then my little Fuji, Fuji CMOS sensor. I'd never really seen that clean of a bias signal. In fact, as you stacked more bias together, it just more turned into the just straight 506. I think it was 506, one of those values and it just got closer and closer to a uniform value of 506. I imagine the camera's doing some sort of something to that data, I don't think that that's clean bias, uh, but that was worth, worth noting. The other thing is the dark current. This camera has almost no dark current to the point that I probably wouldn't even use darks if I owned this camera and used it for longer amounts of time. When you take a dark and you subtract the bias away from it, you're left with really nothing. Like I'm talking zero to one count across the entire image. Um, with that said, there are a few hot pixels. I think I had 43 hot pixels at ISO uh, 200, and I think I had 47 hot pixels at ISO 800, but pretty minimal as far as hot pixels are concerned. So overall, a very clean sensor uh, to the point that I would probably shoot without calibration frames. I'd use flats, but I really wouldn't use biases or dark frames if I owned this camera. I found that it was just really uniform and pretty beautiful, which was awesome. Granted, temperatures were pretty cool where I was shooting. It was down around 30 degrees Fahrenheit, so it was pretty cool, um, which was nice, and I'm sure that that was helping things out. But overall, I really
really, really liked the sensor. Really easy to work with. That full frame sensor was just beautiful. Really, really nice. One thing I'll say is with a full frame sensor and a telescope like the Space Cat, which is made to illuminate a full frame sensor, you're still going to run into some vignetting. So the importance of flats is definitely important. I ended up just cropping a little bit in and cropping off the vignetting to still be left with a pretty flat field. So that was awesome. So to conclude, I guess I would say this. The EOS R is already an amazing camera. And if you think that you're ever gonna have any interest in astrophotography and you wanna buy a camera just for doing general purpose photography, I really do think it's worth it to spring the extra money for the A version of the EOS R. I think getting that live view, getting that H alpha response is definitely worth the added cost. I will say though that if you are just an astro photographer, it probably makes more sense to get a cooled, dedicated astro camera than buying something like the EOS R. For me though, if I had the money and I was starting off fresh and I knew that I wanted to be a photographer and an astro photographer, whew, I know what camera I would get. EOS RA, hands down, this thing is truly awesome. Canon. Only thing I have to say is please, 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 please add an intervalometer and add the ability to use shutter speeds longer than 30 seconds. Just do that for all of your cameras, please. It would help all of us so much. Having a little dinky intervalometer is such a pain. I want to see it. I would love it if you would do it. Firmware update, do it for all of us RA people. I can't call myself an RA person. I don't own it, but do it for all the people out there who own EOS RAs. Hope you guys liked this video. If you did, hit that like button. If you didn't, you know what to do. If you guys have a question, leave it in the comment section down below. Hit subscribe up there or down there to stay up to date with future videos and hit that bell icon to stay updated whenever we post new content. Obviously goes without saying, but special thank you to Canon for providing the camera for this review. I wish I could keep it because it's so, so, so nice. Thanks guys. Catch you in the next one. Clear skies.